The claim that I'm refuting today uh, reads, Embryonic genetic engineering is a socially dangerous medical advancement. I will refute this claim by showing you how it is a sweeping generalization and that there are insufficient signs or secondary claims to reach this conclusion. Uh, the first secondary claim reads, Embryonic genetic modification is considered to be a radical medical procedure that opens the doors to other medical, med medical advances. The subclaim A of this first secondary claim reads, Permitting embryonic modification can lead to legalization of other extensive unnecessary procedures. And an example is, is given in the UK, uh, it's a quote from the BBC News, the UK is now set to become the first country to introduce laws to allow the creation of babies from three people. I will now respond to this first secondary claim by saying that whether or not embryonic genetic modification opens the doors to other debatable medical advances is a supposition. There's no way of knowing how lawmakers will handle such an issue, and it is an unsubstantiated leap to believe that permitting some type of genetic modification will produce a snowball effect within the lawmaking system eventually allowing for embryonic modifications for superficial means. <coughs> A quote by Gillian Lockwood contained in the same source cited for this claim actually diminishes the importance of it when included in the argument. The quote reads, The biggest problem is that this has been described as a three-parent IVF, which means in vitro fertilization. In fact, it is a 2.001 parent IVF, she said. Less than a tenth of one percent of the genome is actually going to be affected. It is not part of what makes us genetically who we are. It doesn't affect height, eye color, intelligence, musicality, etc. Subclaim B of the first secondary claim reads, if a fetus's physical image can be predetermined and modified without question or moral objection, partial birth abortion rates may spike dramatically due to the dehumanization of a fetus. This claim is a guess based on an unlikely hypothetical scenario in which, to use the words of, used by the arguer herself, a so-called radical medical procedure will not be subject to question or moral, moral objection. The, sec the second secondary claim reads, modifying an embryo can be superficially motivated. Now this the secondary claim is simply a fact, and while modifying an embryo can be superficially motivated, it can also be motivated in other ways, such as health concerns due to hereditary diseases. <clears throat> subclaim A of the second sub secondary claim reads, a child is not a toy to be altered to the parent's idea of perfection. A baby is not a bill to bear. This is a hasty generalization comparing advancement in the field of genetic engineering, motivated by medical reasons, to the teddy bear designing store. Subclaim B of the second secondary claim reads, allowing a parent to decide the fate of their child based upon superficial views or opinions is crossing an ethical boundary. Ethical boundaries are subjective, and one could argue that allowing a child to suffer from a disease that could have been prevented is what is actually unethical. Subclaim C of the second secondary claim, a baby is designed to develop according to the genetic makeup. No one should interfere with nature. Now this is just a value claim rather than a claim of fact. And the last secondary claim, reads, embryonic modification is an extremely selfish act. This, this claim and its secondary points are all based on value, with no evidence to support them other than the hasty generalization that medical advancements in the field of genetics intended to help stop hereditary diseases from being passed on will lead to body modification based on personal preference. <coughs> to conclude, the claim that embryonic genetic modification is a socially dangerous medical advancement is a sweeping generalization based on the grounds that advancements, advancements in the field of genetic modification might eventually lead to embryonic genetic alteration for superficially motivated reasons. Thank you. Well, you identify the specific claim. I think that's fun. Uh, we get a quick review of what you're talking about. On the first point, uh, I thought that you had a very clear statement about, uh, you know, it being a, uh, uh, an uns you know, it's, a, it's based on an unsubstantiated assumption that's going on here. 
um, and uh, you had a very effective analysis of the issue there. Uh, you you used the advocate's own evidence as a way of diminishing that particular point. Uh, from a reasoning point of view, I thought that you really had a, a reasonable answer on that particular point. It's, you know, we got a lot of supposition that is then followed up by uh, some guesswork uh, based on assumptions. And uh, that's exactly what's going on here, and I thought you pointed that out pretty effectively. On the next point, uh, you argue it's a hasty generalization, and you kind of critique the analogy, or the, I guess the metaphor it would be, of the Build-A-Bear thing, but I think you're missing the point that this is really um, just a, a figure of speech, and they aren't suggesting that they are the same, but they are suggesting that people might perceive it the same, and that's where the danger is. And I, I don't really think that you've done much more than kind of give us you know, a, a circular argument on this point, saying, yeah, that's exactly what is going on here. Um, the argument that there's an ethical issue that's going on and that, that that's subjective and it's outside of the purview of what this argument is supposed to be about, I think that that's relevant on both this point and the next point that you bring up, and you do a pretty good job explaining those kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, and again, I think that you usually do a, a very nice job identifying the reasoning flaws, especially on that first point, and then at the end in summarizing the argument. You want to be a little bit careful about doing the reading. Okay, thank you.